Hello there, healthcare humans. Thank you so much for coming back for another episode of The Other Human in the Room. Okay, so today I wanted to talk about a topic um, that comes up a lot in my clinical life for sure. It also just comes up in my life in general um, and that I, I've i explored um, in coaching sessions with a number of clients and in groups and in lots of settings. It's certainly in my work as um, an educator, so teaching medical students and family medicine residents, it comes up a lot, which is what do you do when there appear to be multiple right answers, you know? Um, so I wanted to give just like a couple of examples that popped into my brain. Um, one was uh, from a conversation I had with a colleague talking about whether or not to give Rogam in first trimester if there's bleeding or even a pregnancy loss. Some of these you might be like, this is not my niche. I don't know what you're talking about. So that's I'm going to give a bunch of examples. And if none of these apply to like your area of, of healthcare, let me know an example that's right for you where you're like basically about half or a good chunk of people appear to be following one set of um, ideas or guidelines and think that this is their right answer. And then another group are following the opposite. <laughs> so in this case, do you give Rogam or not in first trimester bleeding? I'm sure if I like polled the audience of who listens to this or follows me on social media, it wouldn't be 100% one way or the other. I, I would imagine it wouldn't be. And there would be kind of at times it, either defensive or a, an impassioned um, plea for their answer and why they have it and why it feels good for them and why the other side's a little bit wrong, you know? And so, I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about today is all of that, that thing that happens about what to do when there appears to be multiple reasonable, respected people in your field doing the opposite thing from each other, right? So another example that applies to me very much in primary care is like, basically just approaching any like blood work target-based care. So whether that's especially cholesterol and diabetes, there was what I sort of got in my training and what I think was even on the test of like a certain set of guidelines. And then I learned that there are other ways to do it and other guidelines that appear to be at least, if not even more so based on the studies, it, it's a different way of interpreting the same studies and looking at them in, through a different lens. Um, I was talking about this with um, a colleague and how when they realized that actually the way that they had learned and studied and like regurgitated the guidelines for diabetes, the guidelines, you know, target that LDL less than two, this might be only <laughs> make sense to people. <laughs> first of all, who order cholesterol panels and probably there's different numbers in the state. So I apologize if this doesn't mean anything to you, but like certain target based, um, you know, treat until the number says this. So when they learned that there was actually a whole other way to look at the evidence and the science that actually was pretty convincing to them, they actually experienced that as like an identity crisis. And I think that is very interesting. And I'm going to talk about it later. I'm just gonna give you some more examples for some other ones I thought about. I remember going through training even in medical school and getting very definitive um, in my pediatrics rotation, it was very definitive. Bacterial bronchitis does not exist. If it is bronchitis, it never needs an antibiotic because it is never bacterial. And then I went in like different settings, whether, sometimes pediatrics, sometimes primary care, different settings. And not just to say like um, people with COPD, there's a certain kind of bronchitis that sometimes you do give antibiotics of an exacerbation. I'm not, I'm not talking about those folks. I'm talking about like other kids or adults where many, many doctors I encountered that I learned from or that I practiced alongside were diagnosing bronchitis and giving antibiotics. And so I'm just like, huh? Does it exist or doesn't it? I'm confused, right? Um, does all appendicitis need surgery? That's certainly, I thought that was like set in stone, so classic. And now I'm noticing this is sort of as new evidence emerges, now we're in this sort of dissonance place where people are saying, does this new evidence say that which ones do or don't need <laughs> surgery? how can you tell like what I'm witnessing? And this is more from the outside because I don't directly treat appendicitis in the outpatient setting, but I'm noticing that there seems to be some factions. Um, I don't know how passionate or not passionate the appendicitis conversation is that I can't really tell from the outside, but I'm noticing that say certain centers or certain special specialties are like, 
it, at certain hospitals are like, this is how we're doing it. And then at another hospital, they're doing it differently, you know, and everyone has their reasons. And they're like, this is the right reason for us, right? Um, does all strep throat need antibiotics? I, I certainly learned a certain way and then saw certain people interpreting the evidence differently to say, is that good enough evidence? And then I'm left with like, well, am I supposed to or not? The, am I supposed to? What's the right answer? Can someone please guide me? I don't want to be wrong, right? Like that's kind of the underlying thing that can really be unsettling if we're used to, if we went into healthcare whether it was medicine as a physician or whatever form of healthcare you went into, and you really thought that behind these golden gates, behind in these hallowed halls, you would be finding all the right answers. That's something to reckon with, that suddenly there appears to be multiple opposing right answers that people feel pretty passionately about it. One that I'm doing a lot of thinking about and reflecting on, I actually just saw um, Aubrey Gordon's documentary, which is called Your Fat Friend. Um, she has an excellent podcast called Maintenance Phase and has a couple books. And in, um, and just in general, not just her, but like other folks in the space, like the health at every size space and talking about fat phobia, weight stigma in medicine and also just in society. And I'm really coming to this place of like, does recommending weight loss cause harm or does not recommending weight loss cause harm? And I see those conversations quite active over the last several years playing out in like, you know, different Facebook groups I'm in where there's folks in there that are like metabolic medicine doctors and, and say things like obesity is um, a disease and an epidemic and we need to, we need to be addressing this disease problem. And then there are also other people in there being like, that is totally biased and fat phobic and weight loss causes more harm than good and etc. And now, and actually I have an episode with um, a fellow family physician, a Canadian family physician um, that's about weight stigma. Or maybe I'll, if you look back in my podcast feed, um, it, it's an excellent episode. And so these are just some examples where some of these feel like, how can they both be right at the same time? And yet we have folks marching on as if they are. We have folks, and some of them are more complex in the case of like the weight loss conversation. There's so many layers to it. And some of them in some ways are pretty simple of like, do you give Rogam or don't you, <laughs> right? Like um, giving Rogam or not giving Rogam is a binary choice that, and, and different clinicians are choosing to follow different ideas about it. And that is interesting. Does that need to be stamped out? Do we need to all get on the same page? Like there's sort of sometimes, you know, best practice guidelines. What is the best, best practice? We say those sorts of terms, but what we mean is like, who's got the rightness and are you being right enough? Are you following the rightness or not? Right. And so there's things like that. And then there's things that are more like complex, like where there could be multiple answers between telling everyone to lose weight and never telling anyone to lose weight or whatever. Like there could be so many different answers in the middle for that last example I gave. Right. But I think what makes all of those examples, and I'm sure, I mean, there's so many more. Is there anything in medicine where there's actually only one right way? I don't, pronouncing someone dead. Even then, I bet there's different protocols. I bet there is. Does everyone do the same protocol? Do the death certificates all look the same? I'm sure they don't. I'm sure they don't. So it's like, is there anything? I don't even know anymore, right? And so that can feel so destabilizing. And that's what I want to explore in this podcast is why does that feel so destabilizing? Why does that feel so anxiety provoking in us? Right. And maybe this answer will not surprise you. I've been talking about it a lot on the podcast recently, one bit of it for sure. And I think for me, it's the core bit. Maybe there's others as well, but like, it's definitely about identity and belonging <laughs> for sure. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, I would say that's one of the main things that makes it feel really scary. It is also about the fact that I do think kind of like psychologically, neurobiologically, our body feels good and is soothed and our nervous system feels better if we can have sort of predictability 
in our actions, predictability in how we make choices. If we need to very minutely think through every factor of every choice, like which tooth do I brush first? Like we will be incapacitated because we are making so many different decisions all the time. And so I do think our, I think the right term is heuristic might be the wrong term, but like we, we do, we do benefit sort of psychologically and, um, like neurologically from having a, a, a default, you know, so that we're not having to burn our higher thinking with every single time we see someone who has bronchitis. We kind of have, it really, we don't have to, but it serves us to make a call. It serves us to have a general approach, right? So we need that individually. And then the thing that there's the dissonance with is that if we were just on, by ourselves on an island, then we'd be like, here we go. Here's the only way because I'm the only person. But the real trouble comes when we notice that person is doing something different. And I think there's one part of that feels destabilizing because it's like, is my way safe or is their way safe? Right. And especially, though, if we're really socialized to believe only one of us can be safe. That's the inhuman story that underpins the whole thing. The inhuman story for sure here that really destabilizes us is there can only ever be one right answer. Now, I'm not saying that there, that all answers are right answers. Like most things wouldn't recommend bloodletting for anymore. Most things wouldn't rec recommend leeches for anymore. I would argue that there are some definitely wrong answers. But for honestly, everything I can think of for many, many things in healthcare in general, there are many right ways. And so practicing holding multiple right things at the same time is a useful skill in the setting where there will be multiple humans who are deciding their right ways and how do we be in community with each other, basically, right? And so... The underlying belief that's quite dangerous is that we all have to believe the same thing because it's the right thing. And the reason that feels dangerous is what I said before, identity and belonging. A lot of the ways that we have been kind of organized, whether it's by a national identity or uh, politics or religion, um, a, a powerful way to um, induce people to all act in a certain way is to tell them this is the right way for them to be seen as good and right or to get into heaven or whatever. And so we see that that is a very ingrained embodied thing of like, find the right way so you can belong, find the right way so you can be a part of the group. And even how we teach things like in school, you know, that's why I always found math very soothing because the answers were at the back of the book and there was only going to be one answer to the math problems. The math was only going to math in the one way. So soothing. I still remember actually then in chemistry, which I was like, this is science. So it's to still have answers. Le one year learning the Bohr Rutherford model of the atom. And then the next year learning quantum physics, which was like, you know how we taught you Bohr Rutherford? That's actually not true. Here's another thing. And I was like, so mad. <laughs> I'm like, there's supposed to just be one right way, right? So like that idea um, has its little pockets, but and and you know, we're marked yes or no, good or bad on many kinds of tests, and we kind of we feel that sense of goodness when we are more right, and we get higher praise if we're writer, if we have better grades, right? And then, you know, there's the layer of like if you have the wrong beliefs, you're you're not allowed to join the club. So it's not just about I want to be praised, but like certainly within healthcare, like if you have wrong enough beliefs, maybe we're going to take away your license. Maybe you're going to be fired because like there's got to be standards of practice in medicine, you know? And so, and especially so example like myself, you also had other social settings where that is really like a deep fear in you. So the certain belief system I was raised in, like the religious system I was raised in, though it was saying that like, God was love and all was well, there certainly was a lot of coding for what would actually allow you to be in or out of the club. Like there was mul even just multiple denominations within the religion and which ones were the real Christians was like a kind of a not uncommon conversation to have. It's like, who's the sheep and who are the goats? That's a biblical reference for you, right? And so that, that sense of belonging is so powerful in us. Like that is a biological drive, as I've mentioned before, right? 
And so if you think about how we have these conversations in the healthcare world, right? Like, I don't know if anyone's saying this ex explicitly, but I like when I created these questions I'm about to read, I like felt them in an embodied way. Like, are you a sheep that follows these big pharma guidelines or are you an irresponsible rule breaker who doesn't care about the long-term health of your patients? That's sort of like, which type of badness are you? Which club are you going to be rejected from if you choose to follow the guidelines or not follow the guidelines, right? It can feel as heavy as that, depending on how passionate the conversations are with colleagues that you want belonging with, right? It's like, if you've ever heard any colleague ever say, it's like, well, I don't know how anyone does it this way. Or did you see how that person, like, would you ever have ordered that? Or, you know, what I, I'm sure I've done it. And there's a way you can do it where you're like, I want, I'm genuinely confused. But there's another way you can do it where it's like, I don't understand how anyone with a medical license could ever X, Y, Z. And, you know, that's a, a statement of belonging and non-belonging right there, right? Um, another example is like, yeah, are you a health at every size clinician or an obesity is epidemic is an epidemic clinician? Like there's sort of separate schools of thought, growing schools of thought around this. And they, they start to feel like sides. They start to feel like in opposition to each other. Right. One that we all went through recently was the pandemic. Right. Did you wear masks or not? Did you get vaccinated or not? Um, but even within that, like in healthcare, there was sort of how orthodox are you with your COVID pandemic practices? Are you, are you only seeing your own household? What's your bubble look like? And how leaky is that bubble? Like, sorry if any of this is a bit triggering, but like I, though that, I felt that somatically at that time of like a sense of who is safe or not safe based on how their beliefs are playing out in their actual lives and their actions, you know? And so that's what feels so scary. That's where it's like, can someone tell me the right answer? I think it's twofold. So one is because we do need to decide on an answer to have this little heuristic, to, to have um, our guideline for ourselves that like, you know, most of the time, if an ear looks pretty red and dull in these circumstances, I'm giving an antibiotic and I'm just deciding that I'm not doing a five point um, equation to figure out if I'm giving it or not. Like I'm going to have my general approach, right? So there's that level where it's destabilizing to seeing opposing and many different conflicting approaches because it, it can feel like it's destabilizing our own. Um, and then also, especially if we think the only way we'll be okay and safe in this group is if we find the rightest one so that the most people will agree with us, then the stakes get really high and it gets really scary. Yeah. So when we think about why aren't we all agreeing, like, you know, uh, we're reasonable people. <laughs> Maybe that's the, <laughs> that's another, um, assumption I cannot make. Are we reasonable? Who can say as humans, we are guided by many forces. Um, but along with that, like, I think the thing is, even if we were all given the exact same set of facts, because that's what we try and convince each other with the facts. We say, look at this study, look at that study, but people can be looking at the exact same study and they're coming to op opposing or at least different conclusions. That is happening a lot. The cholesterol example I just gave is an example of people looking at the exact same studies and saying, I don't think that this study means we should treat to a certain LDL target. And like they just have a completely different approach looking at the same science. And so how is that happening? And then if, if they're assuming it's not about influence or it's not about tribalism, but it's just like people looking at the same thing and seeing two different things, you know? And so I think we've got to acknowledge that there's, we have a diversity of values, preferences, I think certainly approaches to risk. Um, what is it that you focus on more? So like say in that Rogam example I gave up front, like are you more focused on the small but very serious risk of alloimmunization if you don't give Rogam? right? Or are you like more focused on only treat if there seems like there's a certain amount of actual likelihood that the thing's going to happen, right? Like n those are just two ways of looking at the same set of numbers. And it's a bit about your general approach. And if you, if you, which kinds of risk you hold stronger than others, you know, and nobody's wrong because either way you're rolling some kind of dice, right? 
are you soothed by predictable structures and plans um, in a way that you actually find them very comforting and you like several layers of them, but then you notice that you get pretty irritated when the human patients don't always follow your beautiful structures and plans? Or are you more soothed by like chaos and anarchy and freedom for everybody? But then honestly, even then you do yearn for something solid to put your feet on from time to time, right? Like we have these opposing forces and I think we have all different levels of all of this inside of us. I don't think anyone's like one thing or another thing. That's sort of like another way of being like right or wrong, right? So, but we're just like never gonna fully agree. The thing I always think about in this space is the fact that there's a number of people on this planet that believe this planet is flat. <laughs> and we, we are apparently all have the same science available to us. And so, you know, I don't think we're ever gonna all get on the same page, folks. I just don't think so. Um, I also have members of my family who are in healthcare and have very different beliefs than I do about what's the right way to do all sorts of things. And I know they have their reasons and they look at their studies and they also have their values and their belief systems that definitely inform it. And I have my values and my belief systems that inform my decision about a number of issues, about what's the, the best way, if you will, what's the right way, what's what I wish everyone else in healthcare would do. For example, about, I don't know, access, access to reproductive rights. I have a very strong opinion personally that opposes members of my family who are in healthcare and their opinions. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna kick one of us out. Like, what are we gonna do about that? Like, that's just true, that exists, right? And that's like, when I talk about multiple truths at the same time, we don't even have to agree that if someone has the opposite belief to them that theirs is somehow true, though it's interesting to try that thought experiment of what is true about the way they believe things, but is definitely a fact that people are believing we have to at least accept radical acceptance. Medicine is diverse. Healthcare is a diverse group of humans with a very diverse amount of beliefs and ideas about like everything. And so thinking that we've got to get on the same page, that is for sure an inhuman story. And actually, I don't know if you've noticed, just like looking at history or at time, like what tactics need to be used in order to coerce and convince and influence a group of people to all believe the same thing. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> it's not good. One thing I, I hope I say it enough explicitly, like everything I say to you is my opinion, my views in hopes that it resonates and then mixes with what you already think for yourself. And then you come up with a totally new thing too. And we'll never have the same beliefs. Like I, that's certainly not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to convert people on my side about anything. I'm just trying to name what I see in hopes that it helps someone else to be like, yes, I see, I see that, but something different. And this is what I also see, like this beautiful thing that can happen if we just acknowledge that there isn't one right way. Can we do that? Can we acknowledge multiple beliefs exist and there could be multiple truths within those beliefs at the same time? One of my good friends says, holding the multiplicity of being alive, of being a human, and then definitely being a human who takes care of other humans, there is so much multiplicity there, right? So yeah, we, we can line up the facts any way that supports our one right way, and then the other people will line up their facts and that will support their right way. But often the facts mix and overlap and contain contradictions, and that's the greater truth. Like that's sort of what I've come to and what I offer to you we can hold the fact multiple truths exist and then decide for ourselves what we want to do in a given situation, what we want our defaults to be. And something happens when we, when we do that. So something actually really beautiful happens when we start to practice holding multiple truths exist, multiple valid options are on the table. And this is what I choose. So the first thing that it really helps with when we do that is we can hold ourselves in a more fulsome way because internally we are full of contradicting truths anyway. That's what, you know, the, my previous episode where I talked about Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman's poem and um, I'm large, I can contain multitudes. That's, that's the same thing. So when we hold the contradictions, when we hold the multitudes that exist in what we even think medicine is, <laughs> frankly, can we, can we expand and hold more and more of that 
that means that internally we can be holding more and more of ourselves, which means then there's less violence going on inside. And that's a beautiful thing. And then the other beautiful thing is we can also hold each other in a more fulsome way. I think I, I'm going to name that doing this work is absolutely kind of like incremental and can be done at your own speed. I've been reflecting a lot about portions of what some call healthcare and what some don't call healthcare that I still have some internalized like bias and wondering of where's my limits why do I feel like I, I need to have territorial boundaries around like certain like alternative practices Reiki what do I think about it and if anyone's a Reiki practitioner just to name explicitly I still think you belong and in terms of certainly a human on the planet but I'm naming my internalized like kind of othering I'm not sure what to do about it all yet how do I hold what seems to be true or right for me, but hold that other people really have different beliefs in even what brings about healing. Like, what do we do with that? I'm, I'm in the middle of grappling with that conversation, actually. So the thing I know to be true, though, is something settles when I find a way to hold more of myself. Something settles and feels more right, more soothing. It feels good and it feels safer. When I find a way, and it like sometimes takes a while to find a way to hold other people. And I am. I'm not holding the whole world yet. Nope, I am not. There are like, people I'm related to where I am doing this work incrementally in a way that feels safe for my nervous system. And I know that's the direction I'm going because I know that it feels so much better than to go inward in terms of when I feel like what I need to do is get tighter and tighter to my rightness, it feels terrible for me, extremely anxiety provoking and, and often is and violent internally because I've got to reject parts of myself that don't seem to be quite right. And then even externally with violence of actions of rejecting people, violence of words and like that person is so whatever, those people are so whatever, like, right? So that's what I know go getting more protectionist has not felt good for me. So getting more inclusive and acknowledging the diversity that exists, I'm just exploring that. So I'm, I'm inviting you to consider the same. And if it feels like, well, I'm not interested in exploring diversity of, I don't know, political beliefs, that's fine. Like, you know, there's like multiple sort of planes of belief. So you know, sticking specifically with the fact that multiple guidelines exist for cholesterol, is it 1.8? Is it two? Or is it actually LDL doesn't matter? Which one, like, let's start with that. In some ways, it's a beautiful thing to practice with because it feels a little bit, though it still feels like identity and it still feels dangerous. To me, it feels less of those things than, you know, religion or politics or something. <laughs> those are like, there's a reason there's rules about not having conversations about us at the dinner table, right? Like those we could maybe expand into. But the field we're in, because there is not one right way, and yet we have these socialized hidden, hidden beliefs that we're supposed to find the right way, it's really good practice. And then especially with each patient, where this patient thinks this is the one right way, and the next patient thinks the opposite is the right way. I hate medicine. Give me all the medicine, right? So we have lots of places to practice within our work here. And the reasons to practice are not only so that you know you can expand and become a more interesting person or whatever though that's fun um but honestly it helps make your days feel way better <laughs> because you're no longer riddled with anxiety that you've got it wrong the worry about being wrong and the worry about not having the one right answer really dissipates when you realize there are multiple ways to be right and honestly it is very rare I am sure, actually, if you look at your day-to-day -day things and the think you think, is this right or that right? I am sure they are both right. It is very rare that I've talked to a colleague or a student or a friend and they've been like, which of these is the right answer? And one of them, I'm thinking like, yikes, that's, you know, a war crime. Or like, <laughs> like, it's very rare that one of the answers I hear is like, well, definitely not that one. Like, no one's like, oh no, should I use leeches? Like, just <laughs> use that sort of silly example, right? Like. The things that we're wondering could be the right answer and we, we're stuck because we want to find the right answer. Usually that whole menu are full of right answers. 
And so that's what can be so relieving and your decision fatigue can feel so much less when you realize, oh, there are, these are all right answers. I, none of these are wrong. There's not like a hidden mine in here I'm going to step on and explode. Actually, these are all right for some people at some times. Now I come back to myself and say, so what do I want? What do I want to do? What is it that I want? And, I, and we can acknowledge ourselves and create stability for ourselves knowing multiple things are true. So our, our decision making and our day can feel a lot lighter. So not only is it this beautiful thing where you can like accept more humanity, which is also awesome, but even just on like the individual daily experience of clinical decision making and deciding what style of practice feels good to you, it's to know your style is as right or is one of the rights and that person's style is another kind of right. And if you're like, Ugh, I could never, that's because it's not for you. Doesn't mean it's not for them. There they are doing their thing. There's you, you doing your thing, right? So it's a, it's a beautiful place to start. Um, I wanted to read a poem that I think really talks about, I hope helps further entice you to consider stepping away from the belief that there's one right way. Um, Cause I think it really illustrates beautifully um, what happens when we think there's one right way. So this is a poem called The Place Where We Are Right. It is by um, a poet, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce his name correctly, Yehuda Amichai. I believe he is a poet from Israel. This was translated uh, by Stephen Mitchell. So I am going to read the poem to you. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard, but doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. When I first read this poem, I was like, ugh, yes, like, because that's the thing. The place where we have to be right, it becomes like a battleground. It's our last stand. You know when it says like, this is not the hill I want to die on? we mean it almost literally. If it's like, we have to be right on this and we will fight to the death about being absolutely right and everyone else is wrong. Nothing can grow from that place. If we want even to get closer to understanding how my right and your right could have something in common, it involves me giving up some of my positioning as needing to defend it with a castle, the ultimate rightness of all time, you know? And I don't even have to give up that my way is right, but it, it's about allowing there to be multiple hills, if you will, or be allowing there to be multiple truths happening at the same time. And if allowing doesn't feel correct, even just acknowledging that that's what's happening. People have these different beliefs, these different perspectives, these different rights that they really, in their heart, believe are true, you know? And I also love how the poem has some hints and some indicators of ways we can move away from needing to protect our rightness, which is doubts and loves. Because that has been my experience. The reasons that I have changed my religious beliefs, social, political beliefs, medical beliefs have been because of these internal doubts and not shutting them off, but listening to times where my body was like, eh, I don't like this. This doesn't feel right. Some of what we think is anxiety about being right might actually be our doubt that this one right way we've been practicing is, is actually dissonant with our values and we don't want to practice that anymore. I have honestly felt that way about the weight loss thing for a long time. And um, I'm not saying this, so I really want to name. So if someone out there is like, I always recommend weight loss. Does that mean I'm wrong? Just listen to that doubt all the way through. Not because it's like, you're definitely wrong, but like, I mean, that's the whole point, right? Me saying one belief doesn't mean that your belief is right or wrong. It means that we're all exploring this together, you know? But when I started to listen to be like, I know the guidelines say this, and I know I've seen it modeled this way, and I know, you know, whatever, the billing code says I got to tell every smoker to quit smoking every single time or whatever, when I let go of that, I listened to my doubt. My doubt actually led me to my more authentic sense of how I want to practice. And the other thing that really led me to a different place was love. So just like I had a lot of ideas about the right way to 
I don't know, talk to someone with an addiction. And then I met some people who live with addiction and walked with them over a period of time. And I feel very differently about it now. And it's because I love them. I've grown to love them as humans and, and, and acknowledge them as humans in a way that before I knew them, it was different. Certainly me shifting my views on homosexuality, which I was taught was wrong growing up, part of it was doubt and wondering if that could be true. And part of it was folks that I know being gay and the love that comes with that and choosing that love over a belief. Like those are the reasons we shift from our positions of rightness. Doubts, which is I think our internal knowing of like, might not be for you, my love. It's like an internal love is those doubts. And then actual love for other humans and realizing, but I love this person, but they're this. How can I love a Republican or I don't know, like, or a Democrat? I'm neither, I'm Canadian. But like <laughs> this thing, right? Like I would say these are the, the two ways in which we do this. And so I just think that poem is so beautiful in describing how we can get out of that place where we are right, you know? Um, I wanted to offer a real example that um, <laughs> shows how I'm trying to shift, how I'm trying to describe the multiplicity of medicine to pa my patients. And I will name, I don't feel like I'm nailing it. And maybe it's because nailing it is saying that there's a right way to do it. I, I, I find I still have quite a discomfort and feel like I'm almost doing a, a tap dance. The things I always say is like, I feel like I'm doing a tap dance and I feel like I'm giving a Ted talk. And, it, and, and those two things feel a little odd, but they're the best I've got to explain the multiplicity. So I wanted to give you a real example of something I wrote to a patient. I re removed anything that would identify this patient. And I just wanted to read it to you not as like the ultimate example of how to speak to your patients, but just to show you what I'm trying to do over here in case you find it interesting. Even if you're like, oh, Joan, I have this other way. You want to try this? And I'll be like, yes, I want to try all the ways. I'm not sure. I am not sure the quote unquote right way <laughs> to tell patients there is not one right way. So, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'm still exploring the ways to weave this into conversation because patients definitely come to us most of the time thinking we've got the right way for them. That's the right way, you know? And so this is an example of a case where uh, they have been to see a specialist and the specialist has um, recommended medication for cholesterol actually. Um, and they are of an age and risk factor category. What I, where I, my training and my understanding of the science is that I wouldn't, I would not have recommended it. And so there's this tendency, do I throw the, I can't throw the specialist under the bus by saying they're wrong. How do I hold the multiple right ways, if you will, in this conversation? So this was my attempt. Um, this, so this is like what I wrote to uh, the patient. This is an area of medicine where there are a variety of opinions. I know Dr. X and their team start medications very quickly and easily and use uh, blood work targets like blah, 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 to drive their decision-making. In my opinion, it's aggressive, which makes sense because they are cardiologists and see the subset of people that experience the fallout of elevated cholesterol and don't necessarily see the much larger number of people who have similar or higher numbers and never experience a cardiac issue. In my primary care perspective of the data, starting a statin before the age of 40 is not based on the strongest evidence, as most, started, most studies started at age 40. And when I calculate your risk, it is low. My primary care guidelines would not recommend you start a statin at this age with your particular numbers. I don't want to put you in a tense or conflicted position about this, even though there's a diversity of medical opinions. I always support each patient to make their own decision informed by their values and beliefs. If you want to do everything you can to lower the risk of possible future cardiac events and don't mind taking a daily pill for the next several decades, then you may decide to start the statin. If you prefer to avoid medication if possible and would like to focus on maintaining a heart healthy lifestyle, this is also a valid decision even when the blood work numbers stay the same. That was a lot. Take your time thinking it over and ask any other questions you may have. So that's what I wrote to them. <laughs> it was a lot, but it contains really what I've been trying to do with my patients. And it's been really interesting, especially the cholesterol one. I'm actually gonna have someone on the podcast soon 
that that is one of like the contributors and authors to like the non-target based cholesterol thing. And I have a bunch of questions for him of if he has any tips about how to kind of tighten up this conversation, if you will, or what language he uses, because it's something I'm definitely still forming my not right way, but preferred way. But I think in there you can see this is how I'm approaching my job in general, is this multiple right ways and kind of naming the conflicts that are there, right? So one thing you might be thinking is like, that was a lot. I'm not going to spend that much time talking to my patients about this. That must have taken her a million years, right? It didn't take me a million years because I've thought about this a lot and I type quickly. <laughs> but would it be more easier and more efficient and convenient, in quotes, if we all thought the same way? Yes. If I could just say to this person, yes or no, Dr. X is a, is a quack, never listen to him, or yes, do whatever he says, I don't care. Like, that's faster. And it's valid when we make fast decisions, when it's what we've got. That's what we have the spoons for on a given day. Very valid. And the truth, the more truthful thing is that the diversity of opinions and positions on how we treat these humans and how we support these humans' health, there's diversity there. It just exists, right? Um, it's actually also really important. We don't want to become a monoculture. You know, monocultures are, you know, when MRSA happens or whatever, <laughs> like, like a diversity is important, period, in nature, and we are part of nature. Having people with different values can enrich a community because everyone's paying attention to a different thing. So like in the Rogam conversation, someone paying attention to if there's a trend of, you know, as we move away from giving Rogam, what may happen, like paying attention to that. And it was important for the folks that when we were giving Rogam more that they were paying attention to whether it was useful or not. Like these tensions, they feel like conflicts and like they could tear them apart. But, you know, what if we're just like people at different watchtowers looking at the same situation and calling to each other like, hey, this is what I see. Oh, really? This is what I see. Hmm, how can we put it together together? Right. That's what could really be going on if we're not like your tower's wrong and my tower's right. Now I'm going to bomb you. Like that's um, a little bit of what happens instead. Yeah. Um, Apologies for the multiple war metaphors in this one. I, it's in my mind, and I just am aware that's a bit triggering for some people. So I will attempt not to for the rest of this podcast. So in general, like one of my favorite phrases is that medicine is heterogeneous. Medicine is diverse. Better, but like I just, that's just, it is not all one thing. When we say we are practicing medicine, we are not all talking about the same thing, folks. We, there's overlap for sure. But we are talking about different things. So... I just like really would love if we start to evolve our conversations with each other to acknowledge and hold that diversity that exists without jumping to rightness and wrongness. And it's something I'm practicing. If, and if you're listening to this and you work with me in some way, like it's, I want to continue to evolve it. If you ever hear me saying something that seems right and wrong, like feel free to call me in on it, you know, or, and, and I'd love to keep practicing this because I think we can do it. I think we can really shift how we do it in a way that then is less shamey for everyone. And actually then we can get to the, you know, if we're all on these watchtowers, like, like, let's sort this out folks, not to find the right answer, but to understand what we're grappling with and to live these questions together. Right? So why are we afraid? What, what, what are we afraid will happen if we do acknowledge that there's multiple right ways? We're afraid we're going to get kicked out of the club. We're going to get fired or you know, lose our license. We, we're afraid we're going to be seen as a bad clinician by colleagues, by patients. We're afraid we might cause harm if we choose the wrong choice. That will lead to the badness, which is a thought error. We, don't, we never know exactly the outcome of something, you know, unless it's 100% fatality, right? Then probably, but that's not going to be on your list. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, right? The thing is, like, we can have those nerves about it. But in my view, seeing more of the full picture is actually what feels, allows us to feel a more of a sense of belonging. Seeing the fuller picture allows us to understand our goodness in all its multiplicities, you know? We are more resourced if we inevitably cause harm, right? And if I'm less inv invested in being right, if I'm not living in the like desolate land of the place where I am right, and I cause harm, I'm actually in much better position to acknowledge that I've caused harm and even shift my position a bit. And that's called learning. That's what learning is. So if we want to learn, we got to let go of the idea that we already know everything. 
Sorry, <laughs> we just do. So I'm practicing it. How can we do it? We can approach ourselves and each other with curiosity and compassion. These are the two key ingredients to connection. I talk about them a lot in Interconnect in my group coaching course. Um, and we really, really try and practice curiosity and compassion with each other in that course. So that's like, those are two key words that I think of a lot and that I, I'm just like, okay, I'm feeling like I'm in the place of rightness. So I guess you could use doubt and love, or I'm just realizing that they're kind of the same thing. That's cool. Curiosity, compassion, if those words feel better than doubts and love, but can we bring both of those things and ingredients into this conversation and see how that shifts our perspective and allows us to let go of the, but, but it, is it the right one? Like that's, it's not as helpful of a question as we think, you know? Can we hold what we do think with an open palm? This is something I learned as I was deconstructing my religious beliefs, actually. is like, maybe I can hold the existence of God in an open palm. And if it's still fitting for me, I can still have it there. But I don't have to have a closed fist where I am just so defensive against any and have arguments against anyone who thinks that God doesn't exist. And same with this. What if I can say, you know, for me, I'm at a point where I'm not recommending weight loss to folks. And... I have prescribed a Zempic for a number of patients who asked me after an informed consent conversation. That's where I'm at. There's tension there. I'm still not quite sure. I'm, I'm feeling my way through it and I am open to further conversation and co-creation with colleagues and patients to fully understand what we're all doing here with this, you know? Um, the last quote I want to leave you with is a quote by one of my new favorite authors that I'm very excited is also going to be on the podcast soon. Vanessa Machado de Oliveira Andriotti. Uh, she wrote this book, Hospicing Modernity, which is fascinating. But something she said in a, in a course I was watching that I think is really beautiful and is an interesting, almost like replacement idea to like who's right, who's wrong. Tell me what you think so I can tell you if you're in the club. Tell me what you think so I can tell you if I'm safe to, to know you or if you're actually unsafe to know. What she says to her students, who's an educator, is I honestly and lovingly don't care what you think. I care about your capacity to dig deeper and relate wider. Come on. I wrote that down very fast when I heard her say that. And <laughs> maybe that's just the place I'm in if you're like, okay. <laughs> but that idea of like, can we dig deeper? That's the doubts. That's the curiosity. That's being open to inquiry of like, what else am I not seeing when I'm seeing this as the only right way? What else am I missing? So that's digging deeper and, and not holding things as so precious and then relating wider where it's like, well, I'm here down here and I'm doing this inquiry. I'm relating to you, even though you're over there and you're saying the world's flat. I don't get it, but can I still relate to you in some way? Can I have compassion and love for you and therefore for myself? And I mean, and this is not easy work. This isn't like cute kumbaya, like, your one and done work, but this orientation to relating to the, to the world this way, to our jobs and all of life, honestly, this way has been very helpful to me. And that's why I'm sharing it with you. All right. I think that's what I've got. So I would just love to invite you to notice how often this week or even this day when you go into your workplace, you're like, oh my gosh, my right, wrong worry is there. I'm really having trouble making this decision and it's because I think one of these decisions is wrong. And what happens if you like, literally it's like you write out your options and you put right, right, right next to each of them and you're like, they're all right. So what do I want to do this time? What do I want to do? What feels like my preference to do? Each of these are safe for me to choose. These are solid choices, right? Like and really kind of practicing in that way, honoring yourself and trusting yourself of, I trust myself that this is my call this time. I trust myself that this is my call this time. I will hold myself and this choice with curiosity and compassion, whatever happens next. That's my invitation to you. All right. Well, I love you all. <laughs> is, that, is that too intimate to say? I, I'm sending much love to you all. And um, yeah, I'll talk to you next week.